Hello everybody and welcome parents and carers to our higher education information evening. Um, I'm Kate Abel, I'm one of the assistant principals um, for student support and welfare and I'm going to just initially give you a slight overview of the next hour and then I'm going to hand over to our principal Simon Lett who's going to say a few words and then we'll start the presentation. So to begin with, the overview of the event is as follows. So Simon's going to do an introduction, then I'm going to do a PowerPoint presentation where I take you through the, the process at Greenhead College for, for the students in terms of applying and things like that. Then I'm going to hand over to um, Lancaster University, who very kindly um, agreed to help uh, with this event tonight. And Lancaster are going to do a, a, an overview of things more from, from the university angle. So they're going to look at student finance, student life um, and a few different things there. So we've got two presenters from Lancaster. So um, all in all, we are hoping it's about an hour. Um, we have got a question and answer facility as well. And I've got my colleagues in the pastoral team and our head of careers as well as Lancaster and myself who will be able to answer your questions and you can ask them as we go. You might find that they get answered as the presentations get underway, but feel free to ask any questions as well. Just to let you know, we, your questions and answers will be published so that if, if we get the same sorts of questions, everybody can see them then. So um, right then, so I'm going to hand over to our principal, Simon Lett, um, who's going to say a few words. Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for attending this event. This is an annual event at Greenhead College and it's always very popular. It's a shame that we can't hold this event uh, in one of our venues so that we can have it face to face, but I still think that it's going to be of use to you and it'll address your questions. The issue of progression to higher education is such that there are always developments every year. So if you're the parent of a son, daughter, who will be first generation in your family to progress to university, I think this event will be invaluable to you. Or if you're a parent who's already got a son and daughter at university and was previously at this college or who's left university, I still think that the event will be really important and of use to you. So I really do hope you get a lot out of it. And thank you for attending and I hope you enjoy. Thank you, Simon. OK, back to me. I'm going to take you through this PowerPoint and, as I said, give you an overview of the application process and things for you to be aware of in terms of your um, your child and their experience um, from now, really, right into the second year. So. OK, so let me start with the application process from from our end, really. So the application form really is the student's passport to a place in higher education. All students will receive training from their personal tutors in applying to UCAS electronically. So what we do in tutorial before the end of the academic year, we, we get students into computer rooms and we get them to sign on and set up a UCAS account. And, and as I said, that, that usually is around June time uh, into July that we'll be doing that this academic year. So that's done initially. So even if students are a bit unsure about whether to apply or not, we ensure everybody's got an account initially. Now they will submit their applications in the autumn term. That is the, the goal so that hopefully everything is done and dusted in that term. Let me just mention here, I know this is predominantly about higher education, but we also ensure our students register for um, the National Apprenticeship website as well. It, often students will want to do both and apprenticeships are growing in popularity. There's some fantastic ones out there. So you'll find that um, some want to, to look at both. So we, we make sure they sign up for both and they're registered on both. Now the UCAS application, some important, the key website for that is UCAS. Dot com, so a nice and easy one. And what that entails in terms of what your son or daughter, what your child has to do, the, the emphasis on them obviously is to complete the, the various parts of the application form. So that includes obvious things, personal details, their education and qualification goes there, so their information about their school and their um, GCSE results go on there, um, as well as their current place of study, so Greenhead and their subjects would go on there. 
then their choices, the all important universities and courses that they have chosen. And that's the bit that tends to take a bit, a bit longer for them to decide. So it might be that it's not till the autumn term that they're clear on their choices and they have up to five. You can do less, but you, you're paying for up to five. And then the bit, and I'm going to talk about this uh, in a bit more detail in a little while, is personal statements is a really key part of that application form and the bit that the students find, if I'm honest, quite difficult. So that's one of their biggest parts they have to do is their, is their personal statement. There's also an employment section, so if they've got part time jobs, that sort of thing that would go on there. And this is what the website for UCAS looks like. So that's where they would sign in for themselves. That's where you can also do a bit of research, get some more information. Now, the UCAS application from our end, so this, these are our procedures. Students have only one application to complete, but there are, as you can imagine, an awful lot. There'll actually probably be over 1,200, well over 1,200 this year. Um, and the process, once the students have paid and sent their application, it actually comes to us, and I'm a personal tutor as well. So it would come to me if I was their personal tutor. And so they get a bit worried when they hit send and they think, oh my goodness, it's gonna go straight to UCAS, it comes to us. But because we've got so many that we're processing, that that just be aware that can take up to two weeks. Some important deadlines here for you. These are our internal deadlines. These are not the full UCAS deadlines. So again, to allow for that process, to allow us to check everything, make sure everything's spot on, to add references and everything else and predicted grades. The internal deadline for Oxford and Cambridge, medicine, dentistry, vet science is the 1st of October. And for all other applications, it will be the 13th of December. So they really, the vast majority really do have that first term to work on this. Um, obviously, the earlier, the better for some. If they're really clear on what they want to do, then they can get that sent off quite easily. Now, in terms of the role of the tutor, I'm just going to mention here. So as tutors, I have access. I can see all of my students that, that are in my tutor group. I can see all their applications in progress on UCAS when I log in and I log in as an advisor. So I can check their forms regularly, make sure that it looks OK. Um, and that's something we do throughout that term. Once the form is complete, uh, students will submit that to the tutor. And the, the key role of the tutor here, as well as supporting the application and talking them through their choices, is, is to write the reference. And the reference involves a reference from each of the subject teachers. So they will have written something, all, all the subjects. And we as tutors then add our bit. So we talk about them as a, as a person. We talk about all their experiences and skills. And, and we also add, again, the all important predicted grades go on there as well. So the tutor puts those on. Now, the personal statement, I, I have mentioned this. You, you might find with your child that there is um, a little bit of moaning about this every now and again. It's, it's hard. It is genuinely hard to write and it's hard to write about yourself. And I think that that is the bit that they find difficult. And it's hard to write about why you love a course without sounding entirely cliched. And, and we, we completely understand that. So they will get a guide to help them with this. They will get support from their personal tutors. We, we see many drafts sometimes and we make suggestions and corrections and things like that. So the aim of the personal statement within the application process is for them to explain, articulate why they want to do a particular course, what skills and experience they have, and, and why it's a particular passion of theirs. And that, that's the bit, as I said, that's hard, hard to get across without sounding entirely cliched. In terms of how much they want to, they need to write, and this, they, they always definitely want to know this, how much have I got to write? You look in, although it gives you specific characters and lines for, for when you add it to UCAS, I think what's easiest to say is it's about a page of A4 typed, and that's what they, that's what they need to aim for. We do warn them that plagiarism is used by UCAS, so they need to make sure it is their own personal statement. And we, what we do, and, the, and this is something for you to be aware of as well when you're supporting them in, in their application, you might read as many drafts of this as I will read as their tutor. They might, I imagine, get you to help them as well. Um, a really good starting point. Look at the course, look at those descriptions on the university websites, on UCAS, 
and it will you'll be able to identify from the course whether that's medicine whether that's law history sociology you'll be clear on what or you should be hopefully clear on what the qualities and skills are and experience that's required for that particular course for you to write about so you'll tell the reader and the reader is going to be the admissions tutor at the university why you're applying and as i said we will take the students through this they get a handout from us they get a handbook actually from us on this so um what their interests are about the subject what they find interest in um, and why they want to pursue higher education um, and we really get them to think about what makes them suitable so again it we you really hammer this home it's about what skills and experience and achievements you've gained from high school from uh, work, from volunteering, um, from here at college as well. I, I always emphasise, we always emphasise, you're gaining massive skills in studying A-level subjects, so we get them to talk about those skills in the personal statement. You'd also include here any clubs or societies that you would, um, or that students would belong to, um, whether it's sport, anything creative, musical, whatever it is, that would go in the personal statement. I've already mentioned this experience, employment, volunteering were going there. And then anything else they've done, any other skills. So Duke of Edinburgh, for example, National Citizen Service, that sort of thing would also go in that personal statement. So I'm going to just do one last bit. Um, we've been very limited this year, as, as you're all very much aware because of COVID, in terms of taster courses, in terms of things we've been able to do, work experience, um, because they would write about that in the personal statement. Um, but what I just want to flag up here is that we have created this year, our fantastic pause team, our work experience team have created a step into programme. So students will have attended various seminars, lectures um, that they've taken part in, that relate to their chosen course or chosen career. So they would put that in there. So by all means, ask your, your child what they've participated in and hopefully they have. There's been an awful lot. There's been hundreds of these um, that have taken place over this academic year. So they could they could write about that as well. And, and this is the bit that makes it hard. It's got to be reflective. So that's hard for anyone sometimes to be reflective on these sorts of things, particularly when we're writing about ourselves and and that's all I'm going to say on personal statements. Um, and as I said, we will be working with your son or daughter on this as well. So um, I can I can assure you that that happens in the tutorial pastoral side. Now these are the, the, the proper national deadlines. These are the deadlines for UCAS. So I'm just going to make you aware. Anything that's I should have said this at the start. If you're desperately scribbling notes here, um, we will put this video recording on online. We'll put it on our website. Um, but this a lot of this information it, you'll also find on the UCAS website. So you've got something called QCAS, so that's for the conservatoire um, applications. We don't usually get that many of those. That's an early deadline of the first. I've mentioned Oxbridge Medicine, Dentistry, Vet Science. They have an early deadline of the 15th of October, so they've really got to kind of get on with this pretty soon. And then all of the applications and art and design, that sort of thing, everything is the 15th of January. Just bear in mind the Christmas holiday. Um, there is time after Christmas, um, but as you can see there, we're back on the 4th. We finish on the 17th of December. Ideally, it's lovely as a tutor, certainly, if you can have all your applications gone before Christmas. You might get a few stragglers in early Jan, and in fairness, that's absolutely fine. Sometimes it's that they're genuinely really struggling to decide where to go, and they're still trying to decide on courses and things. So final deadline, the 15th of January. This is something just to make you aware of, aware of. You might see the odd bit of information about admissions tests. So only certain courses have these, not that many actually. So for medicine, dentistry, you've got the UCAT and, and most universities require that. You've also got BMAT, which is another admissions test for medicine and dentistry, that nine universities uh, and some of them are listed there on the screen. You, London, Oxbridge, um, they require that additional test as well. For law, um, it's the LNAT admissions test. That's only done by nine universities, but there is information on that. If you if you go on to, if you Google LNAT, it tells you literally what the, the nine universities are. Um, it's just important that they double check on the course information on the university websites and on UCAS that there isn't a test that they might have to do. Not many do them, to be honest. 
Now I'm going to mention here applications for medicine and dentistry and I'm, I'm doing that because they, they're early and they are um, quite popular with our students um, and I just want to draw your attention to a few points here. So this is the tough bit for students, they are extremely competitive and that's despite more medical school, uh, schools existing, they are extremely competitive. Um, you would advise the students doing medicine to sit the UCAT early in the cycle. Um, there's a lot of help for that online, so there's a lot of free tests and things they can practice on. This is the bit that I just wanted to be really honest with you about. It, it is, extra, as I said, highly competitive and very high in terms of grade requirements. So you're looking for, for this is for medicine and dentistry, you're looking at an A star, two A's, three A's minimum, and that's for that five year course. And they're also, they do also look closely at GCSEs. So it's got to be at least as a bare minimum, six to nines really uh, for GCSEs, and that includes English language. So really top grades at that level. They will pay special attention to the um, personal statement. So that's where you've really got to get across an interest in the caring profession. And hopefully you've got plenty to talk about in terms of extracurricular activities and interests and things like that. This I always think sounds like a bit of a harsh quote. If the student doesn't meet the minimum medical school requirements, there is no point applying. And that, that isn't us saying that, that's from, from my med school. And, and it is harsh, but it is true that, you know, they re you've got to be at a minimum 3A predicted grades with those high GCSEs as well. I just want to mention, I've only got a couple of slides left, I just want to mention our Believe and Achieve scheme, um, also known as Widening Participation. So if your son or daughter falls into a, a widening participation cohort, so what that means is they either receive a bursary, they're the first generation potentially to go to university, they've been entitled to free school meals at some point, they live in an area of low progression to higher education, they have some fantastic schemes where they can access a lower grade offer and it can be quite a significant reduction. So three A's might become three B's, for example. We have, um, we have two members of our pastoral team actually that actually work specifically on widening participation and believe and achieve and we have great partnership schemes with Newcastle University and Leeds amongst others and so if you think your child fits into any of those categories ask them to, to speak to their personal tutor because it is a, there are some brilliant schemes out there for that. I'm just going to pop these various websites on the screen We've given these out to students in tutorial just in the last couple of weeks and I got students to take a picture of the screen when I, I did a PowerPoint for them. Um, they're really good and, and of, the obvious one is UCAS but also Discover Uni and the Uni Guide and the Complete University Guide. They give a different take on it so it's not just the university talking about how wonderful they are. It, it looks at the student experience from students who've been to that university. It looks at the teaching and learning. It looks at career progression once they've left. There's some great information on there. And then there's an open days one, and we've been extremely limited this last year. I don't want to try and mention COVID too many times, but um, the open days, I always encourage students to attend, even if it does have to be virtual, but to attend as many as they think, um, as they like, because they, you're going to spend a chunk of your life, and, and let's be honest, an awful lot of money on this university and this course. So you want to make sure you're, you would be happy there, you could see yourself there, that the course is right, the teaching is right, and all of those things. So there's some really good websites on there um, as well. So you, hopefully you've had a chance to take a bit of a picture of that screen as well. And just to round up the support, we have, of course, the personal tutor is the first call for the students, but we do a lot of work through the tutorial programme on, on options at 18. We offer one-to-one -one support. Uh, we have fantastic careers advisors in-house here. They will do, uh, they organise various talks for various courses and things like that. They do one-to-one -one interviews. The careers library is another thing they can use to do their research and a careers newsletter as well, which gets sent out. A little quote with our lovely students on the screen there. The best university is the one that best suits your individual needs and I really believe that. You've got to go for the right course, you've got to go for the right university for you and, and that's, that's the all important bit. 
Okay, I'm going to stop talking now and I'm going to hand over to Lancaster University. Hi everyone, um, my name is Elle Gentek and along with Kirk Wadsworth we're just going to be doing a quick section now to give you a bit of an introduction to university, so a little bit more in detail about kind of uh, what things to be researching when it comes to deciding on a university and a course. Um, I'm very fortunate to be here tonight because uh, Greenhead is also the college that I went to, so I'm really glad to be back uh, helping you guys out tonight. And I can definitely say the support from uh, personal tutors and other teachers was definitely something that I benefited from when I was going through this process. So thank you very much, Greenhead, for helping me on my way to Lancaster University. Um, so I'm just going to quickly talk through kind of um, reasons people choose to go to university and why it's important to know what the student is looking for from university when then doing their research. As I say, I'll then try to point out some things to look into in terms of choosing a course and looking at different universities. However, it won't be the be all and ever, be all and end all. There will be other things that you personally might need to look into. Um, Kate's already done a really great job of explaining the application process, but I'm just going to add a, a few little points onto that. And then I'm going to hand over to Kirk, who's then going to talk through kind of student finance and point you in the direction of kind of some further support. So reasons for wanting to go to university. Um, there are lots of reasons why people want to go to university and there's not necessarily a wrong reason. Where it tends to go wrong is then if the university uh, the student attends doesn't actually offer them what they were looking for from this experience. So have a think about what kind of experiences in particular um, the students want from university and then make sure that that university is going to offer that then. Um, to some, it's very much about the increased independence that you get from university, in which case, well, what does that look like? Does that involve moving away? Does it involve moving to somewhere you don't know? Or does it just simply involve studying something you haven't been able to before? And the other thing is actually some people go to university with kind of the next step in mind. So what can they do as a career afterwards and helping to set themselves up for their future? And that's definitely something that is kind of supported by the various statistics that are out there. So consistently it's kind of been found that graduates, so those who have a degree, are more likely to be in employment than non-graduates, those who haven't got a degree. Much just an average, so it's not saying, it's not a guarantee unfortunately, but because of the skills and the knowledge that's students gain from university, it does often enable them to go for higher level jobs, which then often attract a higher wage. Now something, if you are kind of very set on your career and you, and you have a plan in mind, then definitely take advantage of the career service at Greenhead and go and speak to them uh, and make sure that kind of the choices you're making are the right ones. But if you don't know, again, still go and speak to them, but don't worry about knowing exactly um, what they want, what you want to achieve after university. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to go on to um, and I've still done very well out of it. Um, and that's because there are a lot of graduate jobs out there where you don't actually have to have studied a particular subject at university. Um, you just need to kind of gain the skills from doing a degree course. Now in terms of choosing a course and researching universities, well first things first, the course. Uh, there's lots of options out there when it comes to university and it can be a little bit overwhelming. Um, so what we've done here is we've broken it down into kind of four categories. So you have your very traditional courses, subjects um, that you might have already studied. Um, so might be doing it at Greenhead now as an A level or maybe uh, something they've kind of explored uh, earlier on. And if you've got an interest in something, that's a really good indication that it might be a good subject for you at university. Um, the other side is obviously making sure that it's one that you do well at, but I would definitely say that enjoyment is the bigger factor uh, because you're going to go spend several more years studying it. So it needs to be something they're going to enjoy. With me in mind as an example, so I did English language at Greenhead. I absolutely loved it. And then that's kind of how I decided, well, maybe I might want to explore this further at university. 
I then came across when I started looking at universities another subject called linguistics which is related and that's a course that you can't do until you get to university so there might be options out there that you've not yet had chance to explore and through the process of looking at university you maybe hit upon something else that you didn't know existed. Some people choose to go quite broad with what they do at university, so they might do combined to where they do more than one subject and do what is called a joint honours. This is a great way if maybe there's a couple of things that you're interested in uh, and you're not set on just the one subject area. On the other hand, some uh, students are very set. They have a very particular interest that they want to explore and university might allow them that option. Uh, the example here is ethical hacking, which is a branch of computer science. So you might want to drill down to exactly just that. One of those kind of big experiences that's offered by a university is the chance to do a study abroad year or a year in industry, so a placement as part of the degree. Um, if someone is really interested and that's an experience they want, uh, a lot of universities tend to offer, offer it as a specific variant. So it is that course and it guarantees that you will go on uh, to do a study abroad year or a year in industry. And it's definitely worth applying for that as opposed to kind of waiting until you opt on to opt on when once you arrive at the university because your place isn't guaranteed in the same way. So with that in mind, kind of a good starting place for looking at different universities is the league tables. And this is a very common one for people to start with. So looking at something like the Good University Guide produced by the Times and Sunday Times, also the Guardian and the Complete University Guide. They're the three major UK league tables. And these are independent sources of information that basically rank both universities as a whole and individual departments. So it's a good way to kind of start looking at places. But do keep in mind that they do use different criteria. So just because they're ranked in one position in one league table does not mean that'll be the same for the others. So an example being that the Times and Sunday Times League table have the following kind of criteria as part of it. So they do take into account the research that's going on at that university. They look at what's called entry standards, so the entry requirements. So how high are the grades that students need to obtain to, in order to get into that university? Student to staff ratio, as well as kind of spend on facilities and that graduate prospects as well. And the league tables are a good place to start, but they don't tell you about everything about the university. And some really key things that I'd encourage you to go and look at further is the course flexibility. So what choice of modules uh, does that particular university offer you within that course? Because they will differ from university to university. Um, also the location of the university. So you know, whereabouts it is, what it feels like, what kind of vibe you get from it. Um, this was definitely a big thing for me. Um, and as, as we kind of open up with COVID, hopefully you'll get a chance to go and visit universities and get a really good feel for it. But even if you can't, still some of the virtual events will do a lot in kind of showing you what the campus or the local city is like. And speaking to current students will also give you a good indication of that as well. Another metric that is out there is the Teaching Excellence Framework or the TEF uh, and this is a particularly one that pays attention to the graduate employability statistics. So the percentage of students that go on to either further study or professional level employment during that time. Um, gold is the highest level, then it's silver, then it's bronze. So just like uh, the Olympic medals. But I'd argue a better measure is probably to have a look at the career service. So particularly if a key reason for going to university is what you can achieve afterwards, the support that that institution offers you will, and what extra opportunities there are to take part in, such as placements, work experience, uh, mentoring opportunities, they're going to be a better measure um, for kind of what support is there to help you with your next steps after university. 
Another thing to kind of that divides universities roughly, as you can see, you have campus style ones and you have city based ones. Um, and this is where kind of visiting can be a really big part of it, because personally, I really thought I wanted a city uh, based university and then I went and visited one and I suddenly decided, oh no, this is not what I want. Um, and so then I decided that the campus and I went and looked at those and actually they were such a better fit for me. Um, the community aspect to them, the convenience of having the university facilities together and it just being kind of self-contained was much more suitable for me. But I know plenty of friends who just the city was the right one for them. In terms of university facilities, um, again, you can find out a lot about this by kind of looking online. You don't have to physically go and see the spaces to get an idea of what's available. But do remember to consider both facilities for the course and for studying, but also for social because university is very much about uh, that whole experience. It's not just about the course. It is about those three, four years that you spend potentially living there. And if you are going to be moving away, a big part of obviously the facilities then is student accommodation. And there's lots of questions that I'm sure you'll have in mind already that you want to find out. But a key one is definitely the budget. So do they have accommodation within the price range? Um, and also, is there any kind of guarantees uh, with the accommodation? So at Lancaster, if you make us your firm choice university, we do guarantee on campus accommodation for the first year of study. And the final thing I'll say on kind of researching is uh, to look at sports clubs and societies. These are a really big part of kind of student life and the university experience. Um, these are completely student run. Um, so different ones come up each year and students can set up new ones once they join. But if you have a if the student has a particular um, hobby or interest or sport that maybe they're already doing and they want to continue on, make sure then that the university offers you that um, at the same time maybe there's something you've always wanted to try and you know university could give you that chance to try it and the final thing I'll just say on kind of researching is, you know, do look at different sources. Don't just go off one league table or one particular student's experience because just because that student didn't enjoy that that module or that course does not mean that then the students who are applying now wouldn't also um, enjoy it or find it uh, suit it suited them. So do look at various different sources of information and particularly at the moment with things being virtual universities are putting lots of content out on their websites running webinars that students can attend that tell them a lot about what that university is like final things I'll just add on the application process um, just reinforcing the points I've made do plenty of research into the different um, universities and courses because they will vary um, they have are likely to have different entry requirements they also might have different modules so the individual topics that you have to study might differ a lot uh, particularly for some courses they will be very different from university to university don't worry about ranking them when you just input them on the form that's not a rank so you don't have to worry about knowing which is your first choice at this point just put down the five also that you are interested in and that you want to apply to. Um, us as universities, we can't see who else you've applied to, so you don't need to worry uh, about kind of how it will be seen if you've applied to other universities because we don't we don't know who else. Um, and also just as with that personal statement, obviously remember that it is going to everyone. So it's great if you've attended a, a particular university's uh, webinar um, or a, there's a really a particular university you want to go to, but the other universities will also see it. So just keep it a little bit more vague so it's applicable to everyone and it shows an interest in everyone's course. OK, I'm now going to pass over to Kirk to go through student loans and bursaries. Brilliant, thanks, Al. Uh, well, good evening, everybody, and um, it's great to be part of uh, this uh, HE uh, event. Uh, there, there are a couple of more detailed 
student loans and bursaries uh, talks that I think Greenhead already have, they're, they're recordings. So I am conscious that we're trying to condense a huge amount of information in, into about 15 minutes. And, and when I do that, I either uh, delete a lot of slides or talk very, very quickly. Uh, so I have deleted a few slides, but I'm going to keep it fairly uh, calm. So knowing that, um, that you can get access to that other information a bit, uh, a bit later on. OK, so let's um, let's talk about the um, the loans. Oh, it's skipped. Just bear with me a second. We're going to look at the tuition fee loan. So so loans uh, come in two different parts, the tuition fee and the maintenance loan. The tuition fee uh, loan is pretty much the same at all universities. They can't uh, universities can't charge more than nine thousand two hundred and fifty. And lo and behold, uh, the vast majority do. So if you are applying to um, to any university, there is every likelihood that they will charge you £9,250 per year. All home students can apply for this. Um, and when I say home students, there are um, there are bits of information on, on the website, uh, on the student finance website that will give you a very clear uh, definition of what that is. But essentially, if students are from the UK and have spent um, most of their life in the UK or certainly have been there for the last three years, um, they, they can apply for that. It's paid directly to the university, so this money won't um, come anywhere near the family unit or go to the student. You won't, you won't ever see it. It's almost a, a, a box ticking exercise. If you apply for a student loan um, for the tuition fees, then you'll get one. So there are no upfront fees for university. Nobody will ask you to pay a deposit. Once you apply for, for student finance, this, um, like I say, this is a box that you tick and, um, and it will go straight to the university. Um, the next loan is a little bit more complex, and this is the one that um, th that is causes the most anxieties. The maintenance loan. It's designed to pay for everything over and above the tuition fees. That's accommodation, it's food, it's transport, clothes, uh, any resources that you may need. It covers pretty much everything. And one of the biggest challenges that families face is the fact that you can't borrow enough. So there is a gap. And I haven't got too much time to go into that, but um, but the sort of conversations that need to be had um, in the family unit is, how, you know, how how will the how will the finances look? What what you know what what sort of budget will you have to to actually pay for that university um, that university experience? Um, there are two different pots that you can apply for. I'm going to show you that in a, in a table in just a second. Um, the base amount everybody can get. Um, and then the second amount is means tested, and it depends on how much income comes into the to the family unit. Um, whatever uh, maintenance loan you end up being um, allocated, if you like, uh, that will go into the student bank account, and it does that in three instalments. Um, once at the beginning of each term. So university terms are split into three and you will get uh, one third there or thereabouts at the beginning of each of the uh, of the university terms. There is a bit of a delay here folks on the uh, on the slides I'm afraid. Just bear with me a second. Well, I'm, I'm going to stop controlling these and hopefully that will that will make it a little bit slicker. So if you can just take over when you know when I need to move on. OK, so um, the amount that you can borrow with regards to the maintenance loan depends on a few factors. Um, and one of those is where your your child will end up going to university. So you can see that there are uh, three lines here. Uh, the first line covers the amounts that you can borrow if your child stays at home. The second line uh, looks at the the amount that you can borrow if your child uh, goes off to study in London. But uh, the reason why the away from home line is highlighted in yellow is because that's that's the one that applies to the most uh, number of students. So I'm going to give you an example, but the same process applies to the other two. Um, so we talked about a non-assessed uh, pot and that that non-assessed amount, if you go away from home, is 4,422. Um, anybody that applies for a maintenance loan can get up to that amount without any questions asked whatsoever. 
the the next part, the 5,066, that depends on how much the family unit own, uh, uh, earns. Um, £5,066,000 is the maximum amount that you can borrow uh, and it might transpire that you can only borrow, borrow out of that pot £100 because you because your family unit uh, earns an amount that only allows you to have the, uh, the baseline amount. Um, so the maximum amount that you can borrow uh, in total is £9,488 when, when we think about uh, the maintenance loan. Next slide, Al, please. OK, um, and this table here gives you an, an idea of um, how much of the maintenance loan in total you are able to borrow linked with household income. So I said that um, there's an amount that you can uh, that you can borrow. Um, uh, the maximum amount is 9,488 and you are able to borrow that if your household income brings in 25,000 pounds or less. If the household income brings in £63,000 or more, then you only get that left-hand pot, that baseline pot, the non-assessed pot of £4,422. So you can already start to, to work out that actually um, it's, it, you know, it can be quite challenging for family units to pay for everything that, um, that is associated with the university if, um, if, if you can't borrow the full amount. So that, that's the challenge. It's not really paying it back. And I'm going to go on to that in a moment and explain why uh, most people uh, don't need to worry too much about paying back the loans. Next slide, please. Oh. Uh, once you go through the, the 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 process to apply for a student loan is a little bit like applying for university. It's an online system. You'll be guided through it and the form will ask you lots of questions to help determine how much you can borrow and whether or not there are other additional support measures in place. So if uh, a student is um, eligible for a disabled student's allowance or they have an adult that's dependent on them or they have a child, uh, they have um, parents learning allowance, this will be drawn out, uh, that information will be drawn out through the application process. I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but um, but it's very hard to go through the process and not for that not to be um, discovered for you. OK, I'm going to talk very briefly, uh, if I can, about the loan interest and inflation. But before I do that, I just want to point out that 83 percent of students will not end up paying the total amount of the of the loan borrowed, let alone the, in, the amount of the interest. I'm going to be very careful with my words here. Once a student graduates um, uh, and, and they reach the April after graduation, um, the interest changes and once they reach uh, earnings of £27,295, they will, they will start repaying the loan. Um, once they start repaying the loan, they will be repaying the amount of the loan and some of the interest. But once you get to the end of the line, um, and that's 30, 30 years of payments, once you add up the total amount paid back, only um, only 17% of students on average end up paying the whole amount. So I will um, try and explain the interest and loan in inflation to you very quickly because it because most people are quite anxious about it. But the underlying message here is it's almost irrelevant for most people because you won't end up paying um, this amount back. But in a nutshell, when you take out the loans, they are accruing both um, interest and inflation. And when you add those two things together, it totals uh, at the moment 5.6%. So that's 3% interest and 2.6% inflation, or you may hear it, be, uh, hear it be, being called RPI. Um, once, you, once we reach the April after graduation, um, interest is taken away. So you no longer pay interest on those loans. You only pay the rate of inflation, the rate of inflation. And that will continue forever as long as um, the student uh, doesn't earn more than £27,295, that first amount highlighted on the bottom. Once a, a student earns more than that, two things happen. The first thing is they start paying back the loan. I'm going to explain how they do that in a moment. But the other thing is that the interest starts to creep back in. And it's done what, what I think is a fairly reasonable and fair way. The more you earn, 
the more interest is added back to the loan uh, until it reaches the same amount that it was when the student was studying. And that is uh, up to 3%. And if you add that to inflation, that gets back up to 5.6%. Anything earned over £47,835, that interest in inflation will continue. Um, but again, please don't worry too much about this because the vast majority of students will only pay back, in fact, they won't even pay back the full amount that they borrow, let alone the interest. Next slide, please, Al. What I'm going to go on to now is explain how uh, the loans are repaid. OK, so uh, we've already told you when they start um, uh, being paid back. It's as soon as you earn over £27,000, £295 from the April after you graduate. And uh, students, graduates will only ever pay 9% of anything that they earn over that threshold. So the amount that you borrow is irrelevant. It's because, uh, because this loan, this student loan, doesn't act in, in the way that any other loan acts. In, any, in every other loan, you have to pay back the amount you borrowed plus any interest or inflation that is accrued on it until it's all paid back. But because the student loan is wiped after 30 years, it's completely written off regardless of how much you have or haven't paid. And because you only ever pay 9% of anything that you earn over £27,295, that it's not like a, a conventional loan at all and shouldn't really be seen as that. It should be seen as a kind of an, uh, a graduate contribution or a graduate tax. And we're all familiar with how income tax works. Well, if you can just imagine that, um, that graduates have an additional 9% added, but only on the amount that is above the threshold. Next slide, please, Al. So what does that look like? Um, and this table shows you hopefully quite clearly here. So if you earn on the left hand side £27,295, you, you haven't gone over the threshold, so you won't be paying anything back. Um, and the examples here on the left, I think, make it quite clear. If you earn £30,000, that's £2,705 over the threshold. You will pay 9% uh, a year on that, and that works out at roughly £20 a month. Um, let's pick another one, £45,000, that's £17,705 above threshold. It's that amount that is subject to the 9% uh, tax, if you like. That works out at £132. Now, um, next slide, please, Elle. In the, in the recordings, I haven't got time to go into too much detail here, but in the recordings that, um, that I've shared with Greenhead, I do show some examples. So I give some hypothetical career profiles and it shows very, very clearly that students have to earn uh, a significant uh, amount in their salaries over the 30 year period to come anywhere near paying back um, the, the loans. So my strong advice is uh, borrow as much as you can because you're very unlikely to pay it all back. Um, quickly, uh, last thing on scholarships and bursaries. So it's worth uh, in the process of selecting a university, working out whether or not they will support uh, students and family units with the financial aspects. Um, I'll use the example of um, of Lancaster. We we give a um, we give a, a bursary for any family unit that earns thirty thousand pounds or less. It's a thousand pounds a year for every year that uh, students are at university, and our uh, scholarships are linked to academic performance. Uh, and if you if you achieve two A stars and an A. Um, then you will receive £2,000 for the first year and £1,000 for every other year that you study. If you get three A's and it's £1,000 a year for every year that you study. Other universities will vary. Some may link it to sports, some may link um, scholarships to the arts, to music. There'll be a whole range of different things, languages. So it's worth it's worth shopping around. Um, for, at Lancaster, and I have no doubt that it's the same at other universities, you don't need to apply for this. We already know what, if it's linked to academic performance, we already know what grades students uh, achieve when they come here. It's all automatically calculated and students will receive that money and they don't need to pay it back. It's free money. Uh, so it's definitely worth adding that to the list of things that you need to research when going off to university. How to apply, really, really straightforward. You go to Student Finance England, uh, your son or daughter will need to start the process and inform them that they want to apply for finance. Uh, once they've done their little bit, 
24 hours around about 24 hours later you will get an email because they'll need to um, they'll need to tag you into it and then and then the real fun starts and you have to fill out a lot of on online paperwork um, if, if you know what I mean and they will they will ask you to um, to declare a lot of a lot of your finances and what they're trying to do is to is to establish how much um, how much money you can you can borrow and, and again that's linked to the uh, to the maintenance loan. It can take up to six weeks. You don't need to know what university you're going off to. So we, we often get questions uh, that are linked to, well, what if I don't know whether my child is staying at home or they're going to London or what course they're going to, or what university? It doesn't really matter because you can change all of that um, at a later date. The, the time consuming bit is Student Finance England looking through your finances and working out how much you can borrow. Once it knows what column you're in, whether or not your child is staying at home, going to London, or um, or, or moving away uh, from, from the home, but not but outside of London, they will simply press a few buttons and it will spit out the amount that you can that you can borrow. So the takeaway message here is: it doesn't matter whether or not you absolutely know where your child is going. Start the process early. It, um, student finance normally opens around about March in the year that your son or daughter will go off to university. And lastly, last slide or two, I think further support. There are lots and lots of great support mechanisms out there. We always reference the money saving expert, Martin Lewis. He's got a whole range of, he's got a brilliant website uh, that's really user friendly, especially for parents. He's got videos uh, called Decoding Student Finance. He articulates the student finance journey far better than I could. Um, and he's, he's a really, really good starting point, I think, for parents and carers. Um, and I won't go through all those uh, websites, but there's a really, uh, you, you, because you can get access to this um, later on. You can chat to students and parents if you want to get uh, a handle on maybe budgeting or uh, you know more I guess um, anecdotal information about a particular university so feel free to reach out to those and I'm not sure if Elle's already done it but what we will do if she hasn't is we'll put our email address parents at lancaster.ac.uk and this is a great way that if you're processing all of this for the first time and you have questions once we've said farewell this evening then you can get hold of us it doesn't matter whether or not you're interested in going to Lancaster or not um, we're very happy to help um, to help you so please fire away any questions that you have uh, to us post uh, post event I think we're there there we go um, like magic, there's the email address. So please do um, get hold of us and we'll do our very best to get back to you as quickly as we can. I think that is it. A broad brush um, opener of student finance. Kate, back to you. Thank you so much, Kirk and Elle, for that. Just really to wrap up, um, I've put myself back on the screen. Hello, everybody again. I hope that's been useful. We've had plenty of questions which we've um, answered as best we can. And I know there's a lot of information there. It's a bit of an information overload. But a lot of this, the recording we'll put on our website, but there is a lot of stuff and links that you can access on our college website as well. And I suppose as, as the next academic year starts before we finish this year, we will be drip feeding various things and as I said, handbook support, lots of different things to your child. So there'll be more help, more support to come. This evening is really just about giving you the, the initial information. And I know there's a lot, as I said, to take in how we do things here, what the processes are. To get an input from a fantastic university like Lancaster as well has been has been you know brilliant this evening and I, I'd just like to thank them especially for taking time out to help us with this event um, tonight. So I do hope we've covered everything. If you do have any um, follow-up questions feel free you could always email um, your child's tutor um, or myself. Um, as I said there will there will be information on our website and we'll certainly put the recording of this uh, once I figure out how to do that we'll put the recording of this onto our website so it's, it's certainly the first live event we've done in this format from the pastoral team so I hope it's gone okay we would normally be here in person um, and I won't say the, the co oh, I've just said it the COVID word again um, but that has obviously limited things but but at least you're in the comfort of your own home and you've you've got some key bits of information so thank you so much for attending and we hope to see you in person at some point in the not too distant future. So can I thank again Lancaster and thank you all for attending.
Thank you very much. Bye now. Take care.